Mike uh, real happy to, to be able to Skype in everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't make it in person. We're, we've got a lot of exciting things going on down here, and I couldn't get get away for the entire day. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the equity crowdfunding. We had a, a great uh, introduction to a moment ago. I, I really like the fact that we were given the history of kind of how these laws were written by the or created and written by the SEC back in the 1930s. So I think that the, the key piece to remember there is that when, when these laws were put in place, they were put in place for a very good reason, right? Telephones weren't even in every household back in the 30s when these laws were written. So, so fraud was very easy to commit. Folks would go from town to town and kind of, you know, sell land in Florida or, or shares of an oil well in, in Texas, which did not actually exist. Um, and the reason why this is now overdue to, to be updated is that we have the internet, right? We have an ability to verify someone's identity, to, to assure that they actually do own a company which is doing the things that it says it is doing. Um, so, you know, the, the fear of fraud that was creating these accredited investor restrictions is, is no longer no longer necessary. And I actually think that uh, crowdfunding in, in, in a large sense can be a solution to the recession that we, we still find ourselves in today. Um, so, as I was mentioning, uh, I'm the co-founder and president of WeFunder, um, and, and we got in this because we really feel that investing in startups should be for everyone. So, the, the caveat to the fact that this law was passed on April 5th is the fact that, unbeknownst to a lot of people, it was literally illegal to invest in startups if you made less than $200,000 a year or had a million dollars in debt. Uh, um, in the vast majority of cases prior to, to April 5th. So we're talking about a real sea change, the ability of people to invest in companies that they care about. Now, I'll go through this real quick because Tom already covered it, but crowd investing, as we call it, unfortunately in the legislation it's referred to as crowdfunding. So it's very confusing folks when they hear uh, from a regulatory stance, folks talking about crowdfunding legalized. And, you know, as Tom mentioned, this has been happening, you know, for years now. Crowd investing, which is specifically kind of debt or equity financing of businesses, is what is now been legalized and before you could not do. So we're not talking about Kickstarter and these little rocket hubs, all the folks that Tom covered. We're really talking about this new set of, of platforms that will help companies raise debt and equity financing, of, of which we're a part. So we got involved in all this literally back in January before the law had even passed. Um, as we've heard a little bit so far, this is really going to transform the startups are able to raise money. And as startup founders, uh, the entire founding team, we'd always been frustrated that oftentimes the folks that we thought could add the most value to our business from an advisor standpoint or a peer standpoint were legally prohibited from investing. Um, but as we've heard, these securities laws are over 80 years old, so we didn't think there was any chance that this would change. Now, um, in the fall, when, when uh, Patrick McHenry from North Carolina pushed a, a bill through the House of Representatives with a 407 vote, I believe it was, and the back president, you know, we saw this opportunity that there was enough political momentum to really transform early stage uh, financing. So, so we got involved on January 30th by launching a petition to really influence the process in the Senate. Uh, there were two bills on the floor at that point, one of which would have really made crowdfunding dead on arrival had it been passed into law. And the, the startup community didn't really have an idea what was going on. So we got involved to really kind of let startups and, and entrepreneurs know about the opportunity and really help us kind of push the agenda for entrepreneurs in Washington to make sure that this legislation got done right. Uh, we had a forum up in Boston with Scott Brown uh, just a month after, or I'm sorry, we, uh, we got on the petition, we were down in D.C., meeting with both senators, with the White House, with Patrick McHenry, really helping them write the legislation in a way that would be workable for entrepreneurs. Um, and we had a forum back here on March 5th uh, to kind of catch up the, the, the Boston uh, startup community on what was happening in D.C. And this all culminated in our actually being invited to the White House to watch the president sign this, this, this uh, law into, bill into law on April 5th. So it was a roller coaster ride for, for the winter months of, of, of really transforming the way that U.S. security laws work in, in a way that I think a lot of folks don't still have a, a, a full grasp of. So the 
the real question is, is what does crowdfunding actually change? And I'm going to talk about kind of the, the high level details of how this works. I'm sure we're going to hear a little bit more later on about, about some of the details. I'm more than happy to answer questions in the, in the Q&A. But when, when you think of yourself as an entrepreneur looking to invest, you really have two principal challenges that the law previously had created for you. One, the universe of investors that you can actually approach is small. Right, the, the accredited investor restrictions that require uh, you to have either a million dollars in assets or $200,000 a year in income mean that you're really only able to go out to 4% of the population to raise funding. Um, the other side of, of, of that, that coin, which makes it even difficult, more difficult to raise funding, is that you cannot publicly solicit for investment from those individuals. That means you can't post to Facebook saying you have an offering and you want people to invest in your company. You can't take an ad out in the newspaper. If you guys remember what happens when Goldman Sachs was going to do a, a, an offering of Facebook stock before they actually went public and it got leaked to a newspaper, they wound up having to only offer that, uh, that stock to investors because they were afraid that they would violate this ban on solicitation by offering it to U.S. citizens. Now, that is also going to come down on the, job, the Jobs Act, which means that entrepreneurs will literally be able to post in their local newspaper by Google AdWords, access the widest spectrum of investors that they can to invest in their company. Now, there are some, some specific details about how that will work, depending if you're selling to only accredited investors versus if you're selling to kind of all investors. And I'm happy to go, go into that uh, later on if folks are curious. So uh, there was a question earlier about specific caps associated with the uh, with the bill, and, the, and there are uh, some limitations on, on investment that, that go along with the new legislation. Companies through crowdfunding, meaning kind of targeting the the unaccredited investor population, are limited to raising one million dollars per year, and the individual invest investors can only invest up to five percent of their income, if they make $100,000 a year, then that bumps up to 10% of their income if they make between $100,000 and $200,000 a year. Now, the, the kind of basement of, of that number is $2,000. So anyone will be able to invest at least $2,000 a year across as many startups as, as they are interested in investing in. And feel free to suspect me if anyone has questions throughout the, the presentation. Now, we heard a little bit from Tom about how much of of an emergent market is, and it really is huge. I mean, crowdfunding has not been around for that long, and we already saw $837 million transacted through crowdfunding in 2011, um, with the addition of equity crowdfunding that's projected to double in 2012. Uh, so we're really seeing kind of a deep, the way that people want to interact with the nonprofits that they're donating to, with the projects that they're helping come to life, you know, and ultimately now, you know, folks one-on-one -on -one direct relationship with the things that they are helping in the world, and crowdfunding enables that across all the different vehicles of investment that, we, that we've spoken about. Uh, so a, a big question here is, when you look at crowdfunding, what do you think is going to motivate uh, an individual to invest in your company? And, and you can think about this. Um, across a, a spectrum, right? So on one side of, of kind of the uh, investment psychology, you have Kickstarter, where oftentimes the motivation is more about, I want to help bring this project in the work, into the world because I think it's really interesting and creative and I want to help it succeed. You know, it's called a patronage model because of the, the way the arts were, were, were kind of uh, funded back, back in the ancient days. Um, psychology that goes through uh, your average Kickstarter user's mind. Now, on the other side of the, of the spectrum, you can think about a day trader who's in and out of the in a short amount of time and makes investments only oh, oh, purely for a financial gain. Um, and I think the different portal platforms that are going to get into the equity crowdfunding space have different ideas about what is ultimately going to motivate investors to put money into startups. We are of the, of the strong opinion that um, Passion is going to be the primary motivation for investors to invest in, in startups through crowdfunding, right? I mean, there's this idea that every entrepreneur that, that starts a company, that has to go 
know, hundreds of thousands or thousands of people that really see a similar problem or would benefit from that product themselves, but they just don't have the risk profile or the resources to be able to go out there and start the company. This is a way for those individuals to really become part of the business in a, in a meaningful way, right? To, to hunt, hang a stock certificate above their desk and say, I'm investor number 62 and, and what their company is raising funding. And contribute more than their capital to the success of that business. So I've invested in, in a travel startup. I, I love to travel. And the founder is trying to figure out some, some, some insights about how users think about travel, or they're doing a big product launch, they're going to try to onboard a whole bunch of users over a short period of time. If I'm an investor in that company, the likes I'm willing to go through that company are far than if I'm a customer, which is that on, on starter, or you know, customer who purchased your product in the open market. There's, a, there's an emotional question there which uh, is going to make the investing, crowd invest more uh, and willing to provide value add help that they are that they're um, investing. So you know I find this extremely exciting shell, but there are a few things that are going to happen in sequence before this becomes effect in to its full full extent. Uh, we, we spoke about the law being passed by, or signed into law by the president on April 5th, and a 270 day period for the to go through before this will actually take effect. Now, there's actually two types of crowdfunding that will that will come into effect in, in, in different times. The ban on public solicitation that I spoke about, which right now prevents you from advertising and, and, and buying ads for, to, to let people about your deal, that's going to come down likely sometime this fall. As an entrepreneur, if you are trying to raise money from a accredited investor, sometime this fall, you will likely have the ability to really do a big social media push, talk about the specifics of your deal, and bring on accredited investors. Um, the SEC is going to enable the funding of unaccredited investors on January 1st of 2013. But that does not mean, however, that you will be able to start raising money from crowdfunded investors at, in, on January 1st. Uh, FINRA, which is a self-regulatory organization for financial institutions, um, is going to have to go through their own rulemaking period. Uh, so portals like ourselves will have to kind of adhere to all the rules that are written by the SEC and FINRA, go through a registration process. And so for your timelines, we're really looking at the end of, of Q1 2013, March, April at the earliest, where you'll be able to raise from from unaccredited investors through the crowdfund app. Now, that, that doesn't mean that I would wait until that point in time to start prepping. Um, right now, we have over 6,400 users on WeFunder that have pledged invest over $17.5 million. So there's a lot of excitement on our platform already. 30% uh, of the folks that have filled out our investor certification form are accredited investors. Uh, so there's a large ecosystem of, of folks that capital will work. And for unaccredited investors that have never before, there's going to have to be some education. You're going to need to understand what are the variables that, that go into making a startup successful. How do I understand kind of the risk all here? Um, for a big business that I might be nervous making my first investment, how much time is it going to take me to get comfortable pulling out my wallet and, and um, putting in my, my bank account information. So getting up early and starting <laughs> the folks that you're ultimately going to want to bring on as investors is going to be very important. Now we're helping folks a lot with that. We have you know original source interviews that we've done with Wilson. We have about 40 minutes of clips from him, Eric Haley, Jeff Buskang. Uh, we'll be doing before and Tim Ferriss later this summer, a whole slew series of investments um, that we've kind of passed to help pass their wisdom up to everyday investors. We'll have to go to the structure process. Now, also, we got a way under existing to help companies raise money from a small number of unaccredited investors. Um, and that's restricted to a certain number of states. And you know, Kathleen, I'd appreciate you not <laughs> publishing this far and wide. Um, but if there are companies in the room right now that are looking to raise money, uh, we can actually help you out with that. So 
there's a lot of questions, and for those of you who have been following kind of the debate both when the, the legislation was moving through Congress and afterwards, uh, there are concerns about fraud, and there's concerns about whether or not this will work well with startups. And <clears throat> as our meetings with the SEC have kind of progressed and our conversations with venture capitalists have progressed, a lot of those concerns are starting to fall away. So we funder, we have kind of crafted a very specific investment vehicle to make sure that, that startups that raise money platform do not preclude the get investment from angels or venture capitalists down the line. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about the concerns of having a crowded cap table. Now, often that has to do with the specific rights that investors have when they invest in your company at an early stage and the ability for them to block things later on down the road and make it difficult for the, the entrepreneur and the venture capitalists. We've uh, spent a lot of time with our lawyers actually crafting some invest terms that make it such that venture capitalists will not be wary of investing in startups that are crowdfunded, and that's very, very important. Now, the other piece of why we think this is going to be so compelling is the one I mentioned earlier, you know? Rich, several hundred or a thousand small dollar investors that are also, you know, highly aligned to you in order to eventually succeed means you're going to get so much value out of that relationship, be it product and gut advice and feedback, marketing help, or, you know, even putting out a, a, a request for someone to fill that you have open in your company. When you have the, the social networks of 500 people at your disposal to fill that position, uh, the likelihood that you the best candidate goes up tremendously. Now, a, a piece of that that goes hand in hand with having all those investors is that you're going to want a portal uh, which actually helps you advantage in an efficient way. You can't have one-on-one -on -one conversations with 100 individuals on a, on a monthly basis. You have absolutely no time to run your company. Um, so we're thinking very proactively about that. Um, I'm sure many of you who are in, investors on board know what a hassle investor management can be, and we're really looking to make that process as, as efficient and easy as possible. Um, so this is a quick overview of who we are as a team. You know, we're Techstars alumni, serial entrepreneurs. Um, I went to MIT Sloan myself. And, you know, we're a resource for folks trying to figure out what this is going to look like over the course of, of the next several months. And I want to leave ample time for questions since I know this is a new uh, field and, and at different levels of education, at levels of, of, of inquiry. So folks, I'm more than happy to answer them now.